We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Mel Madison, writer, founder, investor, and fintech executive. Mel, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So why don't we start by having you tell us a little bit about your background? Because I think this is, it's really key to understanding how you look at these problems that we're facing right now and kind of how you came to this worldview that you do. Sure. So my background is more in the traditional financial area. I worked for VC-backed kind of private equity uh, startup firms on the West Coast in uh, Newport Beach and San Diego, California. We were involved in the purchasing of uh, small mom and pop uh, financial advisory practices and rolling them up into a bigger company. Uh, That firm, United Capital, was later sold to, to Goldman Sachs in 2019 uh, for $750 million. After my time out West, I went to Duke University and studied to get my MBA, focusing on investment corporate finance, uh, 2008 to 2010. Uh, at the start of 2010, moved out to Seattle, worked for Russell Investments, uh, a large asset manager out on the West Coast, uh, most well-known for their indexes, but they also manage about $250 billion uh, for institutions and retail. And then I had a a personal finance startup, and then I got back into the VC uh, private equity world, uh, operating three different FINRA SEC registered broker dealers, uh, basically doing the financing of stock options for employees at at well-known startup companies. So my background is all over financial services. There's some academic background in there. And I've I've really learned over the decades the inner workings of the financial plumbing, how things actually move. I've dealt a lot with regulators, including the SEC and FINRA, as I mentioned. And at the same time, uh, throughout all of these years, I've also been just accumulating uh, kind of what I would say is an amateur status uh, knowledge, uh, maybe a little higher than amateur of, of financial history and just doing deep dives into everything from the monetary history of the United States, uh, what really happened at Bretton Woods, uh, what were the economic um winds blowing during times of crisis such as the great depression or at the at our founding um i'm big into revolutionary finance and and what happened in the very beginning with people like alexander hamilton and albert gallatin um one of our most important treasury secretaries that i don't think it's understood enough what he did under jefferson and and madison he served as a treasury secretary longer than anybody else in american history Um, So I really combine a lot of that kind of experiential knowledge from working in the business with a historical uh, understanding of banking, central banks, monetary policy. And I try to synthesize those into um, kind of analysis. And I've also put together some of these theories in a fictional format in a book uh, called Quaz, Q-U-O-Z, a financial thriller that delves into some of these topics through a a fiction lens and uh, deals with corrupt central bankers, uh, central bank digital currencies, uh, things of that nature. Hmm. Well, that's that's perfect that, you know, you take these deep dives because that's a lot of what I like to do on the show is take the time to really explore the nuance and get a better understanding of, you know, all of these systems, all of these problems that we have right now in the financial system. But as you mentioned, you wrote this book, Quas, The Annihilation of the Global Economic Order. It's really written, as you said, as a fictional book. Why did you write it that way? Is it easier, do you think, for people to retain that information and be captivated by, by a story rather than just you know being a dry textbook in some ways? Yeah. So I, my first goal, because it was fiction, was to to tell a good story. But a close second goal was to uh, include some educational information and to really kind of discuss, I guess, in a fictional format, some of these broad themes that are happening right now, whether it be the blow up in a sovereign debt bubble, uh, 
uh, what is happening with our monetary system, the the growth and and co-opting by uh, globalists of uh, certain financial institutions such as central banks, how they operate, how they meet clandestinely in Basel, Switzerland at the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, the BIS has a, a big role in the book and a lot of the action takes place in, in Basel, Switzerland. So I wanted to expose people to some of these things that they might have never really understood. Maybe they've heard of the BIS, but they don't really understand its history, its founding, um, all of the special rights and privileges that it has under international treaty, what actually happens there, because they do their best to stay out of the media. You know, they don't even want their names associated with things. When you hear about things like uh, the Basel III endgame, uh, bank capital requirements, there's no mention of the BIS, but those are all being put together in the BIS headquarters building in Basel um, under basically a shadow organization that operates, you know, via the BIS. And so all these things are, are things that I think are really interesting for people to learn about. And I thought by putting it in a fictional format, I could get those ideas across as well as create something entertaining. And I just happen to enjoy also thrillers and, and stuff like that. And instead of having the heroes always be CIA guys or whatever, I thought maybe it would be cool to have uh, a finance guy uh, be kind of the hero that winds up uh, being stuck in the middle of the action. Interesting. So Mel, why don't we go through a little bit about, let's say that the history of the BIS and then how that ends up kind of trickling down and really central banks all over the world kind of coordinating their policy at times. Sure. So the, the BIS is a very important organization financially. It's played pivotal roles in everything from World War II. Uh, I, I think personally that one of the main reasons why Hitler never invaded Switzerland was because of his need for the financial um, kind of capabilities that were imbued to the Third Reich through the BIS and through this international uh, group of financiers uh, kind of connecting the West and the money in the West to uh, to the Axis powers. And uh, that's one aspect of it. After World War II, it continued to have kind of outsized influence behind the scenes. Uh, it was a lot of stuff happens at the BIS, but it doesn't get attributed to the BIS. So the Euro system was basically put in at the BIS. The European Central Bank had its offices in the BIS headquarters building in Basel, Switzerland, before they moved to their own uh, place in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, and now today, uh, you have these bi-monthly meetings where every two months, you know, Jerome Powell, Christine Lagarde, the head of the People's Bank of China, the Bank of Japan, the top 63 central banks in the world are all members of the BIS. They all go to Basel. They meet uh, basically secretly. They don't release minutes. They don't have press coverage. They don't release an agenda. They don't say who attended or didn't attend. And yet you can see that after these meetings, there's all of a sudden this uh, globally coordinated central bank message that comes out. Uh, so most recently, they had their annual meeting in Basel a few weeks ago. Nobody covers it. The financial press doesn't talk about it. But then immediately after that, all the bankers flew to Central Portugal and they did like a public, you know, conferences and they spoke on CNBC and they start speaking with kind of one voice. Basically, it's pretty obvious to any kind of Fed or central bank watchers that they basically had their meetings in Basel. They, they agreed on what was going to be the game plan going forward. And then they go out, they tell the media. And then from Central Portugal, they disperse around the world and they carry out these uh, coordinated policies um, in their home central banks. And I think we're seeing that play out right now with the Federal Reserve, with the impetus to probably cut rates in September because of a slowing U.S. economy, despite that we just had 2.8% GDP get printed. So uh, we could we could get into to, to what I think is really going on with that if you want. But to, to come back to, to the BIS a little bit, um, this is an organization, it was originally founded in 1930 as a mechanism for reparations payments between Germany and the Allies. That mission quickly fell apart because of the Great Depression. Germany stopped uh, doing uh, reparations. 
and they like all great international bureaucracies they kind of search for a new mission uh, as the central bank for central banks and uh basically they had a large contingent of uh, germans and nazis on the board during world war ii that helped facilitate things including uh getting like when they would invade a country like czechoslovakia the bis had control over the czech central bank gold reserves they were the facilitators to actually deposit that money in berlin they literally drove trucks of gold from uh, bis vaults in amsterdam to berlin to help fund you know the third reich uh, there were guys on the board that were later arrested for war crimes um, unsurprisingly, they were all either pardoned or given very light sentences, and they became instrumental in the creation of the euro, the ECB, the the, the one European currency, a central bank headquartered in Frankfurt, Germany, the the ancestral home of the Rothschild banking clan, even. Um, and this, this, so this this role has constantly been played, and today they are literally like the cutting edge on enabling uh, central bank digital currencies. They have all kinds of programs with like CIA sounding names like Project Helvica, Project Jura, Project Orem, um, Project Enbridge, all of these projects with, with central banks around the world, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, basically developing uh, the, the rails, if you will, to implement central bank digital currencies. So they're a very important organization, and yet they operate in the shadows, very little talked about. And the last thing I'll say, and I'll take a break on the BIS, is basically it's amazing that they have all of these special rights and privileges. They're almost mm -hmm. like a Vatican City for central bankers. Their, their grounds and premises are uh, completely sovereign, just like an embassy grounds are. Not even the Swiss authorities can enter BIS grounds without permission of the BIS management. They pay absolutely no taxes, even though they uh, make hundreds of millions of dollars a year in profits. They have a bis.org, uh, you know, website. Even though they they used to have their shares used to trade publicly in Switzerland until not too long ago, actually. So this is a profit making bank um, that has all of these extra legal authorities. They all the management is immune for life uh, from any prosecution, from any acts done in the name of the bis. They travel with diplomatic passports and pouches. They don't need to be searched. And so, you know, why does a central banking organization in Basel have all of these uh, extraordinary rights and privileges normally only granted to sovereign nation states and, and continue to operate in this way? And, and so I think all of that is just very kind of interesting. And I think it's important to understand to, to make sense of what's happening uh, from a global central bank monetary policy perspective. Absolutely. I, you know, I always come back to this idea of incentives. And if you have complete immunity from prosecution for any of your decisions, that's not typically a good way to incentivize these people to do the right things. I mean, we can apply that to many different industries, right? Exactly. And their assets can also never be seized. So they're essentially immune from uh, any type of uh, sanctions or they, they have no oversight when you think about it, when you think about, you know, um, something like e even the Federal Reserve, you know, at least there's ostensibly or nominally some sort of congressional oversight. Theoretically, Congress could could end the Federal Reserve. But really, who could end the the, the Bank for International Settlements? The, they're, 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 there's kind of no higher authority that they report into. And that's the way they like it. In a way, um, they've been able to pull that off a little bit with the uh, ECB, which is very interesting as well, because it's not really beholden to any political structure. It's not like the people of Germany can just dissolve the ECB um, because of the complicated European Parliament system and everything else. Um, you kind of have these central banks um, and BIS kind of growing these tentacles and this power, you know, beyond the political. And I think, again, I believe they are beyond the political. And I think that is exactly why Hitler had no qualms about invading other declared neutral countries such as Norway or what have you, but he he did not go into Switzerland. And I think it was because of the gold, because of the, the financial 
um, enablement that that he was getting provided through through Switzerland. Mm-hmm. Well, it's always interesting to try to understand this, like you say, from a historical perspective and what this ended up, you know, materializing in the real world because of, again, the incentives involved. But Mel, I want to try to understand what's going on currently right now. How are central banks, you know, coordinating at this time? What does that have to do with, you know, let's say the the U.S. having higher rates and not, quote unquote, cutting yet compared to, let's say, the ECB or, or the Bank of Canada that started cutting their rates, I think it's about a month ago now. How does that end up affecting the flow of capital through the world? Yeah. So the financial system, I mean, it is a tangled web that has been woven and it's it's so interconnected that things that might not immediately be apparent to the layman um, are pretty big deals for the financial system. I think we saw, you know, in the last year or two, different points when, for example, the dollar uh, index was approaching maybe 114, or we had, you know, 10-year rates approaching 5%, you start seeing this stress in the financial markets, you start seeing, you know, massive sell-off in, in, in the equity markets. And you're kind of saying to yourself, well, why? I mean, we just went from maybe four and a half to 5% on the 10-year. Why would that cause a 20% or 15% decline in, in equity markets? And it's because these things are so interconnected that they have they basically have like a dozen different balls in the air that they're trying to juggle and keep going. And one of the ways that that whole juggling game would fall apart is if you start getting too much divergence between central bank activity. And so you will you will never hear Jerome Powell come testify before Congress and say, well, we're considering cutting rates because if we don't, we're going to be too divergent from the Bank of Canada or the ECB or the uh, Bank of Switzerland. Um, But yet I believe that's exactly why he is preparing to cut rates in September, because you started to have uh, U.S. rates creep up. You started to have dollar strength. And you started to have some of these divergences that cause these kind of financial dislocations. So just to be you know, a little more specific about it, I think here's the, the narrative that Powell is presenting, that the risks are now more in balance, that there is some sort of a threat to the United States economy, that the labor market is softening, and therefore, you know, in the interest of the United States, we need to cut rates when I really think it's more this global coordination. Um, so what would be my arguments that we're not really seeing a, a softening? Um, I was not surprised this morning when we had our first look at Q2, Q2 GDP, and it's 2.8%. Uh, you know, I don't fully trust government numbers, but I think they give you kind of directional moves. And we went from 1.4 to 2.8. That doesn't sound like a softening U.S. economy. Uh, the other thing that is often pointed to is the jobs market. Now, if you look at the non-farm payroll numbers, those have been very strong. If you look at um, you know, the initial jobless claims, they have not shown any massive spikes of like mass layoffs happening. Uh, and then the one point of data that they love to focus on is there's been uh, a bit of an increase in the household data, which is the, the unemployment uh, rate. And I think what you have to do is you have to look a little deeper than the headline unemployment rate to see what's going on. And it's in their government data. So they have a table in the data. I have it in front of me. It's the household data table A7, where they break down foreign born versus native born uh, workers and what's happening. And if you look at native born uh, unemployment uh, for men, a year ago, it was uh, 4.0%. And now it's 4.2%. So what's been happening, uh, really, when you look at the native-born population, is there's been almost no softening at all. But what did significantly change is if you look at, um, that was native-born men, if you look at foreign-born men, the unemployment rate a year ago was 2.7%, and it's now 4.1%. And so almost all of the increase in the unemployment rate in the past year can be attributed to an increase in foreign born men entering the workforce. And those are also in their numbers. We went from uh, 22.4 million uh, 
foreign born men to 23 and a half million. So over uh, basically over a million men increasing the workforce, the number, uh, or excuse me, that that's the total population. The workforce went from 17.5 million to 18.5 million. And then the jobs of foreign born men went from 17 million to 17.5 million. So what we had was an increase in a half a million jobs to foreign born men, but we had a million foreign born men come into the workforce. That's where the whole unemployment rate increase is coming from. That's not a softening labor market. 2.8% GDP, bless you, is not a softening economy. And yet the narrative that we're hearing from Powell and the other governors is that we have a softening labor market and things are coming back into balance. And I think the real reason they, they want to cut rates, and they're going to cut rates, in my opinion, in September, is that they they recognize that to keep this house of cards of the global financial system operating, uh, they can't have uh, too big of a, di a divergence. It's going to drive up U.S. rates. It's going to cause havoc on bank balance sheets. And so they're they're protecting their owners, right? That's who owns the central banks. The, the 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 Federal Reserve Bank of New York is owned by J.P. Morgan and Citigroup. They're protecting the the interests of the owners, um, and that that's why they're they're doing what they're doing. Mm. Well, I've heard you say before that central bankers have more rabbits that they can pull out of their hat than anyone expects. So why do you think this time is different, and is it partially due to the marginal utility of debt at this point. Sure. So I I think there's been a lot of people when they've analyzed things and they've been, you know, predicting a maybe a, a a global collapse imminently. So I think there were a lot of people say after the global financial crisis in 08 and 09 who looked at the amount of increase in the Fed balance sheet going from like 800 billion to multiple trillions and saying, you know, this is this is unsustainable. There's going to be a collapse. And yet they were able in COVID to raise it all the way up to like nine trillion on the Fed balance sheet. And there's probably even room to go from there. And so I think they they do have these rabbits that they're able to pull out of their hat and what they're able to do and what I think they're struggling, but they're putting mechanisms in place to be able to do now is they see the tidal wave of debt issuance coming down the road. They they understand that the Treasury, uh, in order to fund these massive deficits, these unheard of deficits during peacetime, um, we've never seen, you know, 7% GDP deficits when there's not, you know, a global pandemic or a massive war going on. And we've got entitlements like Social Security and Medicare, where the trust funds are are starting to get to the point where they're being drawn down and they'll be dry in a matter of years. And they, they're they recognizing that there's just going to be a tidal wave of debt issuance. And at the same time, the percentage of foreign holders of our debt is massively decreasing. So. Mm -hmm. China is no longer adding to their treasury holdings. Uh, Saudi Arabia is not buying what they used to buy. So Japan, uh, the same thing. And so you, you're seeing when you look at like IMF data on you know global reserve assets, like the, the the amount of U.S. treasuries just so significantly decreasing on the balance sheets of central banks, uh, being replaced by either. Uh, the debt of either other countries that are more trading partners or or particularly by gold, uh, that they've got to figure out ways to put all this debt issuance without kind of spiking rates to like 10% in the treasury market. And so that's why you're seeing like this um, movement in the Basel III banking accords. Uh, Powell basically said some of these capital requirements that are being discussed are, are too high. We need to have more room on bank balance sheets to hold this. And there was... Also, a letter sent by J.P. Morgan and all the big banks that are members of this organization called ISDA, the International uh, Swaps and Derivatives Association. They wrote like a 10-page letter to the FDIC and to the Federal Reserve and to the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And they said, look, we, we want treasuries to go back to the emergency provisions during COVID where if we as banks hold treasuries, they're not counted against our supplementary reserve ratios. And all this jargon, all, all it means is they're, they're wanting ways for the banks to be able to basically absorb all of this debt issuance. 
and just tuck it away on their balance sheet somewhere and then go out and lever it up and 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 loan it out and and not only do they get paid for holding the debt but then they're able to go out and and loan it out so that all of this de debt issuance can occur and so we these are some of the rabbits that they're pulling out of their hats however what i do believe is that it's getting to be going from a wave to like almost a tsunami of debt that is probably coming and what's going to happen is is there is going to be a recognition in in the bond market that you know a four and a quarter percent tenure just is not a realistic market clearing rate and there's going to be disruptions i don't think those are necessarily happening this year or next year I think the time frame is probably a few years away, but I do think it's it's coming. And I think my time frame a lot a lot of that has to do with just the uh, the bankruptcy of the Social Security Trust Fund that I think is going to happen at the end of this decade. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a there's a lot to pull apart there, Mel. But I'd like to start with trying to understand this control of the price of money, the control of the interest rates, and how that ends up you know, really not sending the right signal to the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the interest rate is a, it's a very important signal. I mean, obviously, you know, by the Federal Reserve moving rates a quarter point and you see the reverberations it can have around the world and financial markets, this price of money, it's it's very fundamental. And, and the U.S. Treasury has been, you know, since... Bretton Woods, basically, in 1944, 80 years ago, uh, to the month, um, has has been the base layer of of money for the global financial system. Is is has been U.S. debt, and so interest rates on this debt um, are obviously very important. They're important not only for the U.S. financial system; they're important for the global financial system, which holds you know trillions of dollars of U.S. Uh, denominated assets in what's known as the the euro dollar market. That's a that's kind of a whole nother story. But uh, but but basically, obviously, the dollar is the foundation, and the interest rates on the dollar are are therefore the price the price of money and very important. When the market is setting these rates, you get a properly functioning economy. When you have the Fed essentially doing yield curve control light, which I think they're doing right now. You get it. You get a complete mispricing of money, and so I would argue that you know the the Treasury yield curve, particularly the long end, is being suppressed by the Federal Reserve. They're able to do this in different ways. They do this through open market committee um, moves, and they can do this without necessarily increasing their balance sheet. They can enter into the market and do transactions. They can buy at certain times and sell at certain times. They can impact the price, and when they're they're able to do it with basically an unlimited you know size of a balance sheet, it's impossible for other market players to fight against it. Even a, even uh, large banks or large hedge funds. Uh, there have been some large hedge funds who have tried to to fight against it or make moves, and they when they, whenever they've disrupted things, you know the Federal Reserve has essentially come down uh, hard on them. So they don't like it when people mess with them setting setting the long term rates. And I think as as evidence that this is occurring, and I want to give credit to a guy named George Robertson who who kind of taught me about this, is he he's looked at what is the real risk-free yield curve. So not to get, you know, too financial jargony, but most of the time when people think of what is the the yield curve, uh the the risk-free yield curve, what they're what they're talking about is the tre the US Treasury yield curve. Mm -hmm. Um I think that there's been a separation between the risk-free uh yield curve, which is the true yield curve that sets market prices and the U.S. Treasury curve because of Treasury manipulation, both on the short and the long end. Um, the short end by Yellen, uh, her bill issuance and different things, long end by Federal Reserve Open Market Committee actions. And the evidence for this is the change in the spread between uh, mortgage-backed securities and Treasuries. So mortgage-backed securities, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they have the implicit and i would argue after 2009 the explicit guarantee of the united states government they have full 
faith and credit backing in the exact same way that treasuries do. Mm -hmm. And yet you've seen this blowout in spreads where you used to see, say, the spread between like a 10 year note and a 30 year uh, agency backed mortgage be maybe around 100 basis points. And right now you've got the 10 year sitting at around four and a quarter and you've got the 30 year agency backed sitting at around 6.9, let's call it 7%. That is a uh, two and three quarters of a percent spread. And yet these are both, you know, fully backed by the faith and credit. And, you know, a 30 year mortgage, just not to get into too much bond math, but it's not too much different than a 10 year note, even though it's a 30 year mortgage, uh, there's always a prepayment element to, to mortgages. And so the duration is not like 30 years on a 30 year uh, mortgage backed security. It's the, the duration can fluctuate depending on prepayments, but it's generally somewhat in line with, with, with a five or, or a 10 year treasury. And so we would expect to see uh, agency backed mortgages have a little bit of a extra yield to take account for the cost to package these mortgages. There's prepayment risks that you don't have in treasuries. And that's typically around 100 basis points, but it, now it's closer to 300 basis points. And so I think if you look at, you know, uh, using the mortgage backed as a proxy for the, for the risk free yield curve, you will see that it has never been inverted. So a lot of the big financial press has talked for a long time that mm. there's got to be a recession coming because the yield curve is inverted. It's always right. And, you know, anytime you get that, you know, you're, you're, you're in for an economic slowdown. And yet we didn't see it. And that's because we've lost the true price discovery of the risk free rate through the Treasury market. But if you look at the mortgage backed market, it's never been inverted. You know, we had 5% on the short end and 7% plus on the longer end. You know, you have a nice steep uh, yield curve and we still do have a nice steep yield curve. And we're and that's why I'm not surprised to see a 2.8% GDP printing. That's why I don't think that we have an economy that's like falling off the cliff. And that's not because the economy is organically so strong and amazing. Uh, a lot of that has to do with when the government starts running $2 trillion deficits, um, you know, it's very hard to, to see why GDP would not be growing. So, you know, I think we have a, a juiced economy through fiscal stimulus. Um, we have a manipulated yield curve that's lowering the price of money. That's also loosening financial conditions more than they should be. And so we have all of these games being played. And I think, you know, certain markets uh, like the gold market uh, sniff this stuff out. And and that's why, you know, you saw gold hit new all time highs last week. It's come off a little bit um, in the last few days. But I think, you know, in general, we've been seeing this kind of consolidation phase with gold between 23, 2500 roughly for the last few months since April. Uh, I think eventually it will resolve to the to the to move to the upside but we're we're seeing these types of actions happen in the financial markets and a lot of it goes back to manipulation of treasuries and the price of money mm -hmm. well that is actually something i wanted to ask you about mel but you know you you explained it in a very interesting way that, that our signal of the yield curve inversion that typically you know signals a recession coming and this being, I believe, the longest inversion in history, or in, let's say, recent history, that when that resolves back above the zero bound, that ends up kind of causing this catastrophic event that is usually kind of given a reason afterwards. So because of this manipulation, do you think that the yield curve inversion signal matters anymore? No, I don't. And I, I went to Duke. I, that's where I got my MBA. The, the professor, a guy named Campbell Harvey, is a Duke uh, Duke School of Business professor who uh, made that whole signal famous. And even he came out when the yield curve first inverted and said, you know, this time might not be right. He didn't give the same reasons I just gave. But he said there are there are reasons why it might not be right this time. And you had all of these big name you know, finance guys, you had like uh, Wilson, I guess, the guy, Morgan Stanley, you had all these people just predicting, you know, these guys making millions of dollars a year to tell people what's going to happen in the economy, you know, saying we're, we're heading for a recession and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it never came. And I think what what's happening now is we're seeing a little bit of a, 
a lull. So you have seen the mortgage rates drop. They were in clearly in the sevens, sometimes in the high sevens. Now they're in the high sixes. So there has been a little bit of maybe um, a little bit of softening, but not not to the point of an inversion of of the mortgage uh, rates to the to the short end. And so I still do not see like a, a recession as as imminent. And yet we are going to probably reduce rates into that. And I think regardless of who wins the White House in in 2024, um, that they have, you know, essentially inflationary type uh, policies uh, coming down the road as well. And so I think despite the fact that people have wanted to avoid any type of a, a dip in inflation and then a resumption, that we will eventually see inflationary forces, but we might not see that clearly pointed out in the yield curve as we would have in the past because of this this manipulation that, yes, it is giving a false signal and it, it, you really have to look at other data to try to get an idea of, of what the, the the yield curve is telling you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting to try to understand you know what signals actually matter again or or now as these markets change but i also wanted to ask you about let's say the the structure of what janet yellen has been issuing for debt and what is the risk in issuing short term debt and how that ends up affecting this picture as well yeah so she uh for any listeners who aren't aware as the secretary of the treasury she has essentially carte blanche control over how the government uh, issues debt as far as its kind of tenor or its its duration. So if she, if she knows that she needs, you know, 50 billion, let's call it in in uh, that's too low. Let's say she needs, you know, she, they, they, let's say because when you look at what's been rolling over and the deficits, it's been I think it's over 12 over 12 trillion dollars in the last year of debt issuance. So so let's say she's got, you know, two two trillion dollars worth of debt she needs to issue in a quarter um, to, to do reissues as well as to fund the deficit. Um, you know, she gets to decide how much of that is bills, how much is notes, how much is bonds. And this is just, you know, again, financial jargon, it's all treasury debt, but if it's a year or less, it's a bill. If it's a year to 10 years, it's a note. If it's uh, longer than 10 years, it's a bond. Um, the way a lot of people, the terminology they usually use is bills and coupons. Um, so, She's been issuing a lot of bills and not a lot of coupons, which is the, the longer dated stuff. That is really essentially another form of quantitative easing. Uh, Nouriel Rabini, along with a colleague, just came out with a paper um, showing that this massive issuance of bills is effective to basically at least 100 uh, basis point rate cut. And the reason why issuing this many bills is essentially like quantitative easing is because, I mean, T-bills are cash equivalents. So you can think of it as creating cash. Um, so she's creating massive amounts of cash that through reverse repo and kind of inside baseball stuff with the banking system is essentially adding to uh, the money supply. And so this, you know, number one, it, it distorts the yield curve. Again, this is a way to keep that long end down because you're having less supply. Uh, you know, if, if she was issuing normal ratios of bills to coupons, you would have had a lot more, you know, 10 year notes being issued. And that increase in supply is like economics 101. You increase the supply, you're going to, you know, decrease the price. A decrease in price and bonds is an increase in yield. So she's she's been, you know, suppressing uh, the yield at the long end um, by this. And then she's been juicing it with quantitative easing on the front end with all of this uh, bill issuance. And so she's talked about, uh, she's also picked up other uh, tools of the Fed, which is like forward guidance, where she puts out in these quarterly refunding announcements that, you know, we're doing more bills and and conveniently, we plan to do so, you know, through the end of the year, right? <laughs> through through the through the election. So so, and, and this is actually really kind of bad for us when you think about it, right? I mean, it, theoretically, she could go into the market and get you know four and a quarter guaranteed on a ten year, and a lot of people might say, well, four and a quarter is not that great. But if we could be heading to five and a quarter or you know six and a quarter, if we could be heading to a higher rate regime because of these inflationary pressures. 
you know, maybe she should be taking advantage of that instead of issuing bills that have to be paid out at over 5%. So we're funding a lot of the government at essentially the highest interest rate on the curve. So it's 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 not good for us. It it's really jacking up interest expense of the federal government, which is now more than defense spending. It's um, you know, causing all types of uh, manipulations in in the curve. It's it's manipulating the money supply. So you know, the, this whole way of funding the treasury with so much bill issuance has a profound impact on the economy. And again, it's one of those things that you know doesn't get talked about a ton unless you're really into following the the financial markets. Mm -hmm. So Mel, one of the other things that you brought up was this idea of the entitlement programs kind of like running dry and, and starting to really run down. What, what is your timeline for that? And, and explain to us a little bit about the mechanics of how that ends up happening and then what that means for the real world, the people that depend on these programs. Yeah. So, I mean, most people, you know, they, like when these programs first came out, the, the, the amount that people paid into them was very small. It was like maybe a percent and a half you know, social security paid by employee, percent and a half by employer. Um, that was unsustainable. And so social security, excuse me, <laughs> and Medicare were basically completely revamped in the 1980s um, under President Reagan. And that's when we uh, started a step function up in, you know, going from a percent and a half to, you know, over 6% or whatever the rate is now for social security um, employee, employer. Um, and so when we raised the amount of money we were taking in at the same time that we had the largest generation in history, baby boomers working and a relatively smaller number of people actually receiving entitlements, we were in this situation from the 80s until 2020, where we were taking in more money every month from Social Security payroll deductions than we were paying out to Social Security recipients. And so this was actually a way to fund the government. Um, so it's not as if we took those dollars in and then put them in like a, a lockbox, as was a term used by people in the past. No, what we did was we loaned those to the treasury to spend, for the government to spend. So the Social Security Trust Fund holds essentially treasury debt. It's actually not like a normal treasury bond. It's a very, it's a special bond issued by the treasury uh, that only the social security administration and agent, intergovernmental agencies like it can buy. And so it's a special funding source for the government that the, the US government doesn't need to go out to the bond market to fund itself. It doesn't need to raise taxes. It's essentially a free funding source. And because we were taking in more money um, than we were uh, spending, you know, it was it was it was excellent and a free funding source. In 2020, that flipped, and we had a max uh, point. I believe it was something like 2.2, 2.5 trillion dollars in the Social Security Trust Fund. And now, as the baby boomers are retiring, we're drawing it down every month. So we are spending more money to fund the Social Security entitlement programs than we're taking in every month at this point. And we are very quickly going to exhaust that. And so one thing that has already happened is we've lost this, this free funding source. And, and the other thing that's happening is the Social Security Trust Fund is now selling these special bonds or letting these special bonds mature, but they're not buying more bonds. And so this is another reason that there needs to be more treasury issuance in coming years. Um, the CBO, their predictions are it's around 2030, 20, 2031, when the Social Security Trust Fund is going to go dry. I think it's going to happen sooner than that because they basically predict, you know, no recessions. They predict all kinds of economic growth. They have a lot of rosy pictures that that say it's going to last until then. I think it's going to dry up sooner than that. But what's interesting about that is it's it's a little bit like a bankruptcy where it happens slowly and then all at once. So, you know, one month the Social Security Trust Fund will be able to make all the entitlement payments that it needs to make. And then all of a sudden one month it won't. And the way the Social Security law is written is the Treasury doesn't have the ability to just cover those shortfalls. Um, it has to be paid for by the uh, 
by the payments by employees and employers. And so the only way to keep Social Security solvent is for there to be essentially united congressional action. So we're going to need to get Democrats and unless there's some, you know, massive supermajority in the Senate and every everything is is one uh, branch, but we're going to need to get some sort of massive congressional um, deal done to try to fix it. And really, the only way to fix it is, again, it's going to be more debt issuance one way or the other. So assuming they could actually fix it, which is, I think, questionable, but the the, the only way out of it is just even more and more debt creation. And so what I see is that, you know, you've got this conflux of forces. You've got this tendency now where we have become addicted to running massive deficits to juice the economy. Uh, we have more treasury issuance being mandated in the future because of the bankruptcy of the entitlement programs. And you also have foreign holders of our debt who are the normal buyers of our debt, uh, no longer wanting to hold it, and in some cases selling that debt into the market. And so you have all three of those huge um, kind of headwinds to, to keeping treasury yields down. And then you have all of these rabbits out of the hat that the central bankers and you know the treasury is trying to do to keep yields down and it's this tug of war. And I think what will be the tipping point where they're no longer able to keep that kind of house of cards together is as we approach this entitlement cliff um, that, you know, bondholders are going to kind of recognize, wow, this is just kind of unsustainable. And because of all the stashing away of treasuries, it's going to have inflationary potential and investors are going to want a higher yield than four and a quarter on the 10 year. And then there's a whole host of problems with that, because once you start jacking up rates, now you're jacking up interest expense. And now it starts kind of that dangerous kind of doom loop debt spiral where, you know, higher rates beget the need for more, more debt, more debt begets higher rates. And, and that's when, you know, I think, you know, you're going to have to have some sort of a reckoning exactly how that's going to play out, you know, have some ideas on how it could play out exactly how it will. I think nobody knows, but I think it's coming. Mm -hmm. So I know you said you don't really have a timeline for that, but, you know, what is your, your rough guess for when we might hit this kind of, as you said, this entitlement cliff? Well, I, I think it's probably around 27, uh, 28. And I think it I think, as I mentioned, it's going to take congressional action to to kind of fix the social security problem. And so I think it's going to be a huge issue in the next presidential election. And mm -hmm. uh even Jeffrey Grunlock, one of the biggest bond investors in the world, said that debt and deficits will not be a major issue in the 2024 election, but he believed it will be the number one issue in the 2028 presidential election. And I, I agree with that. And so what I think is this is going to come into the zeitgeist, it's gonna come into you know the common vernacular, people are going to understand there's a bit of a monetary crisis going on in a way that you know for people who follow this, we understand this is coming, but markets tend to be very short term. They're looking ahead a few quarters, maybe six to nine months. And as long as it's you know a year, two years down the road, they tend not to, uh, pay too much attention to it. But I think in 2027, 2028, we're going to be at that place where it gets within their um, radar screen of like, uh, you know, six to call it 24 months in the future, where there's really going to be this, this problem, and they're going to uh, begin to act accordingly. I think people are going to want to sell treasuries. I think this is where you could see a uh, a failed treasury auction, I think you could then see uh, organizations like the Treasury and the Federal Reserve start to go to all kinds of, you know, extraordinary means in order to uh, keep the Treasury market functional. And, you know, that's that is one of the mandates of the Federal Reserve. It's not just full employment price stability. It's also to essentially maintain a properly functioning Treasury market. And they will put aside their mandates for um, price stability in order to keep the treasury market functioning. And that's where you could see a massive ramp up in the Fed balance sheet in a way that, you know, it makes COVID look small. 
where where it just gets to be a point of uh you know the only way they're able to absorb this so that they can keep interest rates at you know call it four percent or something like that is to is to go back to buying trillions of dollars worth of bonds and that will you know have that inflationary impulse that the covid uh money printing had and that's why you know i'm very bullish in the medium and long term on things like precious metals um because i think these these alternative monetary assets are where people are going to start looking as places to kind of hold their money, um, understanding that the dollar, uh, even though it's been a losing bet, you know, all along, it's always a depreciating asset um, that that it's going to it's going to ramp up and, and be depreciating even quicker. So, Mel, when we think about that time and, and let's say those mechanisms of this you know, blowout of the debt market, let's call it. What what proportionate effect does that end up having on, let's say, pension funds and 401ks and that kind of class of monetary instruments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's that's going to be a big problem. So a lot of the buyers of treasuries are pension funds because they're trying to match up, you know, liabilities um and and have assets that are going to pay out according to those uh when those liabilities come due. And, you know, in some sense, they've been able to get away with using treasuries because even if they were buying treasuries at 3% and, you know, the so-called CPI inflation rate was, you know, let's say 2% for a long time or lower, you know, they were able to kind of match those liabilities. What's going to happen now is that treasuries are going to massively um, underperform what they need to in order to to satisfy those liabilities. And so that's where the, the problem is going to come into play. And I think you've already seen like there's manipulation of the CPI data um, that that's very obvious um, because, you know, things are uh, connected to CPI, things like uh, COLA, cost of living adjustments, um, the tax brackets are connected to CPI. So by understating CPI, you move people into higher tax brackets more quickly than they otherwise would. And so you're going to have pension funds that have been, you know, relying on treasuries and they're going to say, well, we're not going to be able to, to meet our, our, our liabilities with these, with these treasury bonds. And they're going to be, you know, looking for other assets and they're also probably going to have shortfalls. And that's going to be the drying up of another source of a large buyer is that you're going to have, you know, it's, it, it is a doom loop that feeds on itself. So once these pension funds wake up to the fact that treasuries are not going to hold their value um, uh, the way they need to, to meet our liabilities, they're going to start moving away from treasuries as well, just as foreign central banks around the world are moving away from treasuries. And so you're getting more and more into this situation where the buyers are going to be need to be the Federal Reserve as well as the big uh, commercial banks. And that's why you have these big commercial banks wanting to get things like treasuries as basically counting zero against their supplementary reserve ratios. And they're wanting to be able to essentially stick as many treasuries as they can into the commercial banking system, which will increase the money supply and cause inflation, but at least they'll still be able to si sort of loan out uh, against those and continue their, um, their monopoly. So I, th I think th they're trying to create these rabbits, but as, People wake up to it as financial markets wake up to it. Uh, you're you're just gonna it's gonna be impossible to avoid havoc, and you're probably gonna see a massive repricing of the dollar. It could even be as dramatic as something that happens overnight, where um, you know the Treasury Secretary has the authority to revalue the dollar versus gold, um, you know, through the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Um, you know, Treasury could come out and say this is in the uh, there's a special manual. So so the Federal Reserve does their accounting according to a special set of accounting standards. It's separate from like gap accounting. And and part of part of in those standards is is the right of Treasury to come out and revalue gold against the dollar in the same way that they did that in the depression where it was around $20 an ounce and then it became 35. Mm -hmm. And and you you could have Yellen come out and immediately revalue gold at ten thousand dollars an ounce. And 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 then that gets entered in as an asset on the on the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Um, all kinds of things to kind of reset the dollar um, in really a massive emergency way that we haven't seen in almost a hundred years. 
but that we, that but that we have seen happen in the past, uh, most recently in in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the Treasury doesn't price or mark to market the gold that they own. I think they it, it's something like forty two dollars an ounce right now, right? Um, yeah, exactly what it is. I'm not sure what it is, but it, it's. It, I think the the point because the mechanisms are very complicated, and I have mm-hmm. to admit, I need. To, it's been a while since I studied these, but the the bottom line is they have these rabbits that they that people have most people have never even heard of or don't even know exist mm-hmm. that they're able to do to do this monkey business so that they can make all the accounting work and make all the. Um, essentially they can uh, throw a narrative out there to the financial markets. Okay. Now we're solvent, right? Like, yes, we, 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 we messed up. We, we, we got ourselves into a dead bubble. We, we overspent. No, it was the last guys that got us into this bubble. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Somebody else did it and we're going to, we're going to um, adjust our ways. We're fully repentant. <laughs> and, and the way we're going to get through this is going to be through this one time, massive uh, revaluation of the currency, but it's never going to happen happen again and you know we've learned our lesson and we're gonna so they i think i think those are very desperate moves but we might be getting to a point where they're going to need to pull out those desperate moves in order to keep the financial system solvent but once you start doing things like that i don't think there's any way to avoid like massive financial market volatility like you know like during this period of of this uh, ongoing rolling crisis i mean i think it would be uh very reasonable to expect you know extreme volatility extreme spikes in the vix in the equity market uh drawdowns of at least 50 60 70 percent from highs um you know where it ends up at the end of it who knows because stocks are priced in nominal terms and so if all of a sudden apple iphones go from costing fifteen hundred dollars a phone to five thousand dollars a phone you know what does that mean for an apple stock price um, you know, the, the the equity markets will eventually figure that out, I guess. But in the meantime, during this kind of crisis moment, I think there would be a, a rush to safe havens and not the normal safe haven of treasuries, but there would be a rush into uh, gold and silver and for some people, uh, Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Thanks for joining Mel and I for part one of our discussion. In part two, which will be available on Monday, We delve into the valid apprehensions regarding bank bail-ins and the great taking. We also provide an analysis of Russia's economic situation and shed light on significant religious symbolism within the upcoming U.S. election. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.